Welcome back, Sullivan Fortner, for part two of our interview. Uh, we ended part one. You were talking about how Oberlin was like a conservator, uh, was like a boot camp, and it mm -hmm. got you set for New York. But you also mentioned that, uh, that you came to New York a few times during those years to hang out in the summer a little bit, and that your first gig in New York was with Theo Croker? Yeah, the first gig was definitely with Theo. I remember doing a lot of things with him. I remember a gig that we had at Smalls. I remember we used to do these seem like semi-annual things at the Rubin Museum. Um, I remember one time doing it with Jimmy Cobb. I remember doing it one time with like Billy Hart. It was like he would get like different people. You know, I remember that being something. Well, you, you gave us a great uh, description of what it was like going from New Orleans to Oberlin. So now I'm wondering if you can tell us what it was like uh, going from Oberlin to New York? Because of the teachers that I had there at Oberlin, I felt that coming to New York would have been a little bit easier to deal with because um, I knew those guys and I was like, okay, I have to end with Theo. Uh, my old roommate was Arnold Lee, so I had a place to stay. And then I got into Manhattan School of Music my senior year of Oberlin, so I was going to school. So education was kind of like the good segue into the scene in New York, you know, being a student of Jason Moran's and Dave Liebman and people like that, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, you know, the, first of all, the faculty at Oberlin and now the, these people that you mentioned, these names, I mean, like, on the one hand, they're all in the same group. These are some of the greatest musician teachers of all time. Oh, yeah. And on the other hand, uh, or on the same hand, maybe on a different finger. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very different musical worlds. Some of oh, yeah. People. Oh, yeah. And so what's it like, you know, for you at this point, uh, dealing with all of no, this? No, I mean, I think Oberlin kind of taught me, if anything, was is, is just how to learn and how to just be open to learning, no matter who it's from. And even though they were completely from different worlds, like one hand, Dan Wall was giving me Bill Evans and giving me, you know, add like all of this kind of different kind of harmony and implied harmony and, 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 and like introduction to things that I got that I would get later from people like Dave Liebman and Phil Markowitz at Manhattan School of Music. Jason Moran gave me introduction to solo piano playing. He gave me an introduction to like different styles of solo piano. So like he gave me stride, he gave me Ragtime, I mean, he loved to listen to ragtime rolls. So we would listen to ragtime rolls together. Um, he gave me just a little bit more of a historical base and how it kind of influenced his concept of music. Um, and then he introduced me to stuff that he got from Steve Coleman and, you know, just like Cassandra Wilson stuff. And like, so I was getting like all of this while at the same time on the road with Roy Hargrove and Stephon Harris. So that happened while writing smack dab in the middle of my of my of my schooling at Manhattan School of Music. So is this a a master's that you're getting? At this was a master's Manhattan? degree. Yeah. I see. And who's running the department? What was it still Justin DeChocho? Or? Yeah, DeChocho. 
it was Justin and uh, Chris Rosenberg and um, the crew. <laughs> it was the crew. Gary Dial, you know, yeah. Did you get a chance to play in the big bands there too? I did. <laughs> it was funny. My yeah, I started, I did jazz philharmonic orchestra, and I did the big band for like three semesters, three of the four semesters I was there while on the road. So that was interesting. <laughs> All the students were like, well, Sullivan's here today. <laughs> Where's he been? I said, I was in Europe with Roy. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. You know, people and I really would like to, to dig into your, your time with Roy Hargrove for a moment. Yeah. I don't think that I've ever seen a more natural musician than Roy. Um, he was very, very quiet. He was a man of very, very few words. And he seemed the most at home when he was playing. I've never seen a musician that was more, ex more respected across the board of jazz musicians. I mean, because you have straight ahead people, and then you have the avant-garde cats, and then you have the people that kind of like merge somewhere in the middle. That's everybody across the board loved and respected him, you know. Uh, he he was one of the main influences of a a whole generation of musicians who probably would not be playing jazz today if it weren't for him. Um, you talk about, I mean, his, and he completely embodies um, everything that the music was and everything that the music is. He can sit on a bandstand with somebody like a Jimmy Heath and a James Moody and then turn around and play a gig with an Ambrose and be the same Roy Hargrove. You know what I mean? He can, you know, he had a sound. I remember the first time I actually sat and heard Roy sound. And it, um, I, had, I had been in this band for like two or three years by this point. And he was playing at a jam session at Smalls. And I sat right at the bar and I was facing his bell and I actually heard his sound. I actually heard what everybody heard about him for the first time. You know, because there's one thing to pop behind somebody and then there's another thing to actually hear them and to sit in front of it and just be an observer. And I was like, oh, and, and he had a sound. His sound alone moved people. And he had a very, very singing, very, very warm quality, especially when he picked up the flugelhorn. Um, he was a, I think he was a singer. He was more than he was a trumpet player. He was a singer. And there are a few instrumentalists that I find in that category who were singers more than they were instrumentalists. Like Mulgrew Miller to me was a singer more than he was a pianist. Um, Kenny Barron to me is more of a singer than a pianist. Um, and Roy definitely fits in that pantheon of musicians who you when you hear them play you hear Sarah Vaughan singing you hear Billy Holiday singing you know what I mean you hear you hear like Phyllis Hyman and you hear Aretha Franklin and you hear all of Mahalia you hear all of these people in this one sound you know really really special really really I don't think there will never be another Roy Harbour <laughs> never ever did you get to meet Larry Willis? I sure did. I met Larry Willis. I was doing a recording session for Bill Lee. My, the end of my senior year at, at Oberlin, the end of my senior year at Oberlin. And um, me, and his, me and his youngest son, Arnold, were like best friends. We, we were roommates. And he got me on this recording with his dad, playing all of his dad's music and recorded for Steeple Chase. And I guess Larry Willis lived in that same barn that we were recording in. So he would come down and we had like one or two conversations. And those conversations really like transformed my life. You know, you meet some people and they say like one or two things that change you. You know what I mean? He, he told me, he told me, find, he told me to develop your own personal relationship with the piano. Not, 
and not like some like some shallow version of it like know the piano like you know your girlfriend or like you know your sister or your mother this is, and he told me said this is my relationship with the piano the 88 keys 10 fingers so you will always lose because the odds are always 88 to 10. but if you treat her with respect and you pay a visit to her every now and then you you get to know her from the inside out and you come before her humbly she will take you places you never thought you'd go she'd have you playing for a whole bunch of people you never thought you'd play with and she'll take care of you financially <laughs> you know things like that things like that for like somebody coming out of college is like you know and of course he had a relationship with roy for years too oh god I, I i honestly feel like there was no pianist that was more in sync with roy than larry willis That's which, somebody, is really, which is so interesting because he's of the of a different generation he's a yeah. he's an elder compared to roy but they became like yeah. a, a team yeah they were like that's just like that's like one person literally I, I don't that they almost had like a kind of telepathic energy that yeah i just don't know what that is <laughs> this is some people find their match you know what i mean some people just find the people that you know where have you been all my life you know and i don't think i experienced that until you know hanging with cecile honestly who was in the band uh when you joined roy and what what was your I, i'd say favorite version of it but what's the what's the version of the band that you that you really click with? Oh man, um, probably the first band I heard of Roy's when I was studying at Oberlin. It was, oh man, uh, Mark Carey, uh, Rodney Whitaker, Gregory Hutchinson, and Antonio. Antonio Hart and uh, Ron Blake. I remember that. Like that, that, that configuration to me was like top tier Roy top tier Roy's band and then next would be Larry Willis and Willie Willie Jones and Gerald Cannon and Sherman Irby I think and that's probably to me the peak of Roy that's like when Roy was like like at his high and mighty that's like the, the best that's the best Roy to me now you mentioned at the same time that you're in the middle of all that you're touring with Stephen Harris which is a real yeah. different musical universe oh yeah blackout can you talk about that and that band and what it was like working for him and and i i have these multi-tiered questions and but uh like co comparing roy as a band leader and comparing stefan as a band leader and what your role is and how you found your own sullivan fortner voice with these really distinct musical worlds mm -hmm. why you're very young yeah it was, it was definitely a uh uh, interesting thing for me trying to first of all fill in Mark Carey's shoes which which is like the band Blackout was basically centered around Mark and and Stefan and Casey and Terion. you know what I mean that's like that was like the core that in it as the core that grew um I think when I when, when I was doing it that the, the album Urbanus had just come out and we were touring that we were touring that album a lot um to to have stefan as a as a as a mentor and a coach you know coaching me through that ensemble and like helping me to try to see one one thing i remember him telling me because roy didn't really say a lot with me playing with his band i didn't really roy didn't really talk a lot but stefan did stefan sat me in the corner a few times and really had some really hard to hard conversations with me and I remember one conversation he told me, he said, I'll never forget it. He said, play from the core of the band sound out, as opposed to playing from out and then finding the band core sound. In other words, what I got from that was a lot of times musicians like to imply certain things on top of something that's already there. You know what I mean? Like, I'm getting all this harmonic information. I'm getting all this dry stuff from Stefan. I had all of these years of school and I want to get it out. Not really knowing that 
there's already an established sound and already an established approach in the band. So finding what that is first and then finding a way to put your voice in there and kind of push those boundaries, massage those boundaries, not push them and not be aggressive. You know what I mean? Um, Stefan was, Stefan back in those days, to me, I, I, I learned, I learned how to be more of a team player playing with Stefan. That's probably the one thing that's, if I could say there was one thing I got from Stefan, it was how to be a team player and how to, how to work with what's already there rather than to imply something. Uh, just just be forceful about whatever it is direction that you're going or where you want to go you know now i'd like to branch out towards today your work with cecile your work on your own and the sullivan fortner that everyone knows in the jazz world which is you know a distinct musical personality and i'd like to talk about like the evolution of your point of view and at the same time because i mean everything we've been talking about is ultimately so contemporary. I mean, these players and you know, you know all this stuff, yeah. and and yet you're someone for whom, obviously, just from listening, the tradition of pre Bud Powell piano and pre Herbie Hancock piano and mm -hmm. also means so much, and that you bring it to bear in in your 2020 way. So mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about how did how did that start to manifest itself coming out of school, coming out of Stefan's band and Roy's band. And how did how, how did all that happen? Um, I would say it was Roy, honestly. Um, Roy, being in that band, coming from from all of that rich harmonic information and all of those different colors and all of that stuff, Roy kind of Roy wouldn't say anything. He would never say anything, but there were certain things that he would play, and I'd be like, "What is that? I know that sound, but I can't pace where it comes from." And then Justin Robinson, I was like, so when Roy does that, what does that mean? Or when Roy plays this, where does this come from? Where's the, where, where's this tune come from? So this is a bad, this is a Bud Powell tune, son. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about those recordings. <laughs> so it kind of made me go back. And actually Justin was the person that kind of inspired me to go and study with Barry Harris. To start those, to start going to those classes that he did at the uh, what was then, at the time the uh, the it was like the it wasn't it was like on a it was on 66th Street near Juilliard. It was that that old Y over there YMCA, and uh, I would go there every Tuesday and sit and just absorb a lot of stuff. And a friend of mine who actually got me to gig with Roy Rodney Kendrick told me he said if you go to Barry Harris's class which you should be doing on a regular basis. You go over there and you play him a transcription of Bud Powell, he will love you. <laughs> so I, I learned like the introduction of uh, how my heart stood still. And I think that's where Barry kind of started kind of like, where's Sullivan at? Sullivan, play that intro again. Uh, so I'll play it and then he kind of would, and then I would play for him and he'd be like, no, don't do that, do this. Um, what the Barry, where does that come from? Man, just listen to Bud Powell and Charlie Parker. Just listen, like for real, listen to them. And then that changed my life forever. There's nobody that can ever tell me anything different about Charlie Parker. And then from there, I started getting all of these calls to like do solo piano gigs and duo piano gigs with singers. And then that kind of led to, okay, trying to figure out, okay, now I guess I should probably really go back to this stuff that Jason was telling me about this stride stuff and like really trying to get this whole, this whole concept of playing solo piano together. And that kind of dug me into a rabbit hole of research and of all of, all of, all of my favorite players and figure out who they studied with, who were the cast that they checked out. And, and then that kind of just, that was just how that happened. If someone came to study with you now, and wanted to learn about, you know, jazz piano before Bud Powell's time. Where would you direct them? What do you listen to? What are, what are you, some of your favorite moments? Oh, God. Um, Pre-Bud Powell? Um, 
I would probably start them with Earl Hines and Teddy Wilson. To, just to be honest. I mean, because, I mean, for, for me, for me, they just, it, 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 it's something about the New York sound and it's something about the, the New York style of playing that to me kind of shakes toward them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it kind of digs towards that approach of that mentality of orchestration that mentality of use of the left hand, the, 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 and how they use the information in the left hand and how they dealt with time. You know what I mean? Even more than Tatum to me. You know what I mean? I would, I would, I would give them Tatum much later. Um, I would also say Duke Ellington because, I mean, in my humble opinion, Duke Ellington is the greatest piano player that's ever lived, bar none. I don't know, that I, I, to me, that's it. <laughs> Um, good stuff. I, I, I've just been going back, me and Cecile have been listening to a lot of those early recordings from the 20s, early 20s and 30s. That, that, his plan on the air, man. <laughs> I'm like, who? Like, this is like, this is Tatum before Tatum, really. You really, you really find that he's like the man behind the curtain, pulling the strings to a lot of those people, Tatum and Teddy and all those guys. Monk. <laughs> monk, oh, 100% Monk. 100% Monk, 100% uh, Willie Lyon. All those people, it's just like, and then you start to really kind of understand where people like Sun Ra are coming from. You start to understand where people like uh, uh, Muhal Richard Abrams and Abdullah Ibrahim, all those people with that kind of sound, Herbie Nichols, some of that stuff, it's really coming out of Duke, man. It, not just the right and the piano playing, man, all of it. All of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, so, I, was I was listening recently to some early, early Sun Ra recordings. Like right when he had just came out of the Fletcher Henderson Orchestra. And I was like, man, this is like some, this is just like, this is some Duke. This is the straight up Duke. <laughs> yeah. You know, you mentioned working with Roy Hargrove, and of course, in Roy's band, you know, Larry Willis had been there, and a lot of people, that was kind of like an established sound. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then you have made recordings and toured extensively with Cecile McLaurin Salvant, who earlier on, you had kind of like arrived alongside with Aaron Deal, and that was a particular sound. And in both cases, you found your own thing. We've already talked about Roy Hargrove. Uh, let, let's talk about your association with Cecile. And, uh, how it came about and how you fashioned it. How Spike Wilner gave me two nights at Mesro. I want to say December uh, 2015, something like that. I think I just won that competition and Spike gave me two nights. And I was like, okay, I, I was talking to a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, and I asked her, I said, who do you think I should get? I, Spike gave me two nights. I don't know who to get. You, she was just like, call Cecile. I said, Cecile who? <laughs> I don't know who to Cecile. Cecile McLaurin Salvant. I was like, oh, yeah. And, and I remember playing with her at a jam session at Dizzy's. Like, we played like Body and Soul. And it was just like one of those pass, pass off things. I wasn't really paying attention to her. She wasn't really paying attention to me, whatever. But she knew who I was, and I knew who she was, of course. And um, I, I wrote a message on Facebook. I was like, look, I have two nights, these two nights. Can you, would you be willing to do a night with me at, at Mesro? She was like, sure, I'd love to. I was like, I thought she was going to say no, because by then she was nominated for that Grammy and, you know, all that stuff. I was just expecting the worst. But <laughs> she, she agreed. And I went to her house, I think, the day before. I went to her house in, in Harlem. And we, re we rehearsed some stuff. And I remember trying to be, like, you know, trying to be a little flirtatious with her a little bit, you know, trying to size up. She didn't bite at all. She was just, like, like strictly business. So I was like, okay, cool. I played one song, and she stands over the piano. She's like, yeah, I don't think that chord you're playing right there is right. And I'm like, oh, shit, it's going to be one of those gigs. <laughs> So anyway, 
after the, the, the next day, the day of the gig, I call Aaron. I think Aaron's like in Europe somewhere. I call Aaron. I'm like, Aaron, I don't know how to play with Cecile. What do I need to do? What do I need to think about? And Aaron said, man, Cecile will sing anything. So sing, sing, she'll sing, she'll, he said, she'll sing through a tornado. So don't change anything you do. She'll find it, she'll sing right through it, no problem. We did the first tune in the first set. And this is the first time I ever seen this happen at any, at any club. Cecile was facing the piano right before we started. She turns around and faces the audience and the whole audience goes quiet. Goes completely quiet. I'd never seen that before. I was like, oh God, she's powerful. <laughs> so we did the first tune, and then after the first tune, we looked at each other. We were like, uh, let's play that. That's all right. Okay, that's great. That's fun. That felt good. Let's do the next one. And it just kind of like just kind of was like that the rest of the night. We would play and she would sing something. I look at it, I was like, I was just thinking that somebody would do that and you sung what I was thinking and she said you're playing exactly how I imagined somebody playing behind me in this particular scenario so we kind of had like this moment where we were like are you reading my mind no you're reading my mind no you're reading my mind and um so then she was like let's keep doing this I had a great time and the rest is what it is <laughs> How did it evolve professionally from that point? I mean, what happened? What, what, was it a recording first? Was it a tour first? Was it trying to see if the magic still happened? I mean, how did it happen? Well, after that gig, I think I called her again for something else at Dizzy's. So we did something at Dizzy's. And then she was like, I, then she told me after that gig at Dizzy's, she said, look, I really enjoy playing with you. Um, I really would like to take this on the road. I was like, okay. I wasn't thinking much about it. I think she was really serious. But I ended up doing a few gigs with a quartet. Because um, Aaron had some other, some other stuff to do with his trio and some other things. Um, and then I think in 2017, we did like a gig in Burn, And then we followed that up with a recording session. And that was when we recorded The Window. So touring and then the record and then touring. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So how did, on those first couple of gigs that she did with you at Dizzy's and also down at, at Mesro, so say, were your gigs, were you calling the tunes? How did you uh, work on the repertoire? Uh, she called them. She called them, and I, if I didn't know them, I learned them. Um, and um, sometimes, she'd be, sometimes she would call me and be like, Sue, she calls me Sue. Sue, do you know this song? And I'm like, no. I said, do you want to do it tonight? And she was like, no. I said, because I can learn it tonight. We could play it tonight. She's like, no, 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 no. Let's let's wait. Let's do it. Let's hold it for the next time. <laughs> you know. But there'll be times where she would she would tell me about a song, and then I'd show up having it learned, and she doesn't know it. So I'm feeding her lyrics, or she'll sing something that I don't know, and she's feeding me the chords. You know, it's kind of like a it became like this whole back and forth thing with each other. And then the more comfortable we got, the more risk we started to take with each other. And then... You mentioned that, you know, someone like Roy Hargrove, like in, is in essence, like a singer, happens to play the trumpet. Um, how do you think, is Cecile basically uh, a musician who happens to sing, if you know what I mean? Uh, or is that an analogy that just doesn't stretch, it doesn't work? Um, Cecile is more of an artist who happens to be a musician also. Um, I've never met anybody that's more well-rounded and just embodies art, just artistic, just, just completely artistic in every sense of the word. I mean, between her visual art and um, her music, a lot of people don't know about her cooking. She's a really good cook too. Um, yeah, that opera she wrote, or the yeah, the, the, yeah. She's a great storyteller. She's a great story writer. She's a very creative thinker, and she writes well. Um, just she's just all all around brilliant person. What's your what's your ideal musical setting? I mean, I assume you may have more than one, but but you know <laughs> what what would you 
given your druthers, I don't even know what druthers are, but you know, given your druthers, what would it be? Where would you place yourself right now? Um, trio, duo, solo, mostly. More than quartet or quintet. Just like, I'm really been into the, this been into like trio and solo particularly. And who are, your fa who are among your, your favorite trio players for you right now? Um, mean in any instrument or just piano trios? Or what do you, what do you? I guess I, I could rephrase it and just say, who are the musicians? Forget musicians. Who are the people that you would like to surround yourself with uh, in either duo or trio settings? Oh, oh, that's interesting. Um, that's an interesting question. I've been kind of messing with a lot of different configurations in my head. Like what? Uh, I was, I've been thinking about trio with um, just piano and piano, bass and, and percussion, not drums, but like hand percussion. I've been thinking a lot about playing with like, um, oh, um, saxophone and guitar. I've been thinking just uh, uh, like vibes and vibes and drums. I mean, just like. Just different. I've been thinking about organ trios a little bit. It's playing more organ. Um, oh man, uh, yeah, just just like just a lot of different things. Um, there are a few musicians that you know I wanted to do stuff with, and I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> you know, people like Miguel Zanon and um, people like um, um, I don't know. Andrew Surreal, you know, just, just, you know, people like that, just some different, just some different things to shake things up, you know, for me. Andrew Surreal is uh, such a master and uh, I think he just turned 83 mm -hmm. and playing, just playing as well as he ever played and such an, uh, such an original. There's no one on the planet like him or Milford Graves or people like that there. Yeah. One out of a one out of a million. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Henry Threadgill, all those people who just yeah, just like you just don't. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of them. <laughs> a lot of people like them. Yeah. I'd love to hear you with them. That would be fascinating. That would I would be absolutely love it. fascinating. You mentioned before Ellington and your love of his music, your love of his piano playing. Uh and I guess just of him, of his him as a person and what he did. Um, uh -huh. Now, early on, uh, before he was 30 years old or just around that time, he tried, he was interested in getting rid of the word jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, and even later on, after that was a lost cause, uh, he would still refer to it as the music of my race or the music of my people. But the word mm -hmm. jazz itself was something he wanted to get rid of. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the positive and negative aspects of the word, what it means to people. Do you feel that you're in some sense limited by being called a jazz pianist? Would you rather the people just said, I like Sullivan Fortner's music and not append an, uh, a name to it? Where, where do you come out on all that? It's funny because I don't know. I, I guess I never really thought about it that much. Just to me, th that word almost doesn't really have as much power anymore. You know, it, it doesn't. I mean, I, 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 part of part of my argument about that word is it's like it's almost like it's it's a word that somebody else gave the music that the musicians were created. The musicians never called it anything. They never even thought about putting a label or a style or any type of name attached to it other than, and that's in any art, that's in visual arts. You never look at, I mean, I don't think Picasso would have called himself a impressionist artist. He just did Picasso, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? He Schoenberg just, hated the word atonal because atonal you know, means, it was, means without tones, right? Right, right. it's just like, it, 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 it almost has no power. So, but it I has would, power, but it has, as we all know, it has power in the marketplace or it has yeah. 
it, yeah. power there. And so we're kind of. But we shouldn't, as an artist, shouldn't feel limited by a, a name that somebody else places on it. But you know, um, it's funny, you know, but even within the jazz world, uh, I don't think that the musicians ever called it hard bop or cool or modal or no. all that or straight ahead. It was just what, what they did. Right, that's right. How they heard the music and what they did to it. You know what I mean? And then let everybody else call it whatever it is. I mean, some people called it Chinese music, called Bud Powell Chinese music. <laughs> I mean, you know. So I, I, I'm curious, we talked about Andrew Cyril and you mentioned Miguel Zanon and, and other folks among mm -hmm. all, all the names that we've called here. Are there any folks on the outside of the jazz world? either, you know, uh, in whatever pop music is or whatever different kind of musics are that you'd like to collaborate with or that you see some intersection with, or no? Oh, man, there are a lot of them. Uh, at this point, man, I, I, I'd, be so, I'd be so happy to hang with somebody like a Greg Filling Gaines. <laughs> you know, or the... I'd be happy to hang. I mean, I remember like one of the most inspiring moments, I think, was the time I got to hang with David Foster. Like that was, that was really inspiring for me, you know, just to watch his approach and watch how he, how he produces artists and how he works with singers and how he deals with uh, tracking and orchestration. And it was like all of those things that that was like a really, really great time. Uh, Working with Paul Simon was amazing. That was that was incredible. What did you do with Paul Simon? I I arranged I arranged two songs and played on three on his last album in the Blue Light. Um, I did some folks' lives roll easy. How the heart approaches what it yearns and questions for the angels with him, how which did is how that come about. How how did it happen? I mean, he called you, but I mean, I mean, how did he? How did it happen? Um, it happened. Uh, Jamie Haddad, who was actually a teacher of mine at Oberlin, was a, is a percussionist uh, and played with Paul Simon for years. And I guess Paul had a an a, a idea for a project where he wanted to take some of the songs that he had written that he liked and either didn't finish or it didn't take off the way he wanted to, and he wanted them to be reworked. And I guess he got his inspiration from the record that he did with Herbie. The, I think it was the Imagine record where they did, uh, he did a uh, uh, Do It For Your Love with Herbie. He's like, I want to do my whole, I want to do my whole next album like that. And I want to use an artist that people don't know. And so Jamie called me and I was like, I, I was so stupid. I was like, I get to I call my dad. He's like, Dad, I get to work with a beetle. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, what? That, he that's Paul Mick Jagger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, you dummy. This is Paul Simon. This is Simon and Garfunkel. So I went and dealt with all of that music, and then you know, kind of, you know, that that just that whole thing, and hanging with him in his and just how he approaches music. He, he, that's, that word genius is flown very, very loosely, but he's really a genius to me, for sure. Sullivan, this has been absolutely fascinating. The time has flown. We, we've done two interviews and learned a lot about you and your musical life. And all I can say is, I guess I'm just one of a huge amount of people who are looking forward to what the next chapter holds. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the, the time. And that concludes part two of a two-part interview with pianist Sullivan Fortner. This has been Harlem Speaks, one of the many online programs offered by the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. My name is Lauren Schoenberg. I'm the senior scholar at the museum. You can find out more about what we offer at our website, www.jmih.org, at our Facebook page, also uh, on our YouTube channel, where many of these interviews ultimately live. On behalf of the staff, our board, our volunteers, everyone at the museum, we want to thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again.